morning, good afternoon, good evening to our wonderful speakers, chairs, and audiences of the ACNS webinars. We're back again with another session of very interesting lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from Griswold, Germany, Professor George Waldorf. He is the vice chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery and the head of Center of Neuro-Oncology, University of Medicine, Griswold. His research interests are mainly focused upon intracranial neuroendoscopy for hydrocephalus and cysts, and also endoscopic assisted skull based surgery, endoscopic endonasal surgery, and brain tumor surgery. We are extremely honored to have him as a speaker at our webinars, and today he'll be talking about endoscopic third ventriculostomy techniques, indication, pitfalls, and complications. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Brazil, Professor Eduardo Vieira. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Hospital de Rastera Sao, Refice, Brazil. His surgical expertise is mainly focused upon cerebrovascular surgery, and we are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars. And today he'll be talking about open cerebrovascular surgery in the endovascular era. The chair for the first session of today is our honored guest and senior faculty from Malaysia, Professor Azmi Elias. Professor Elias is the head and senior consultant neurosurgeon, Department of Neurosurgery, Tunku Abdul Rahman Neuroscience Institute, which is Iktar Hospital, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He's also the head and senior consultant neurosurgeon at the Department of Pediatric Neurosurgery, Hospital Tunku Azizia, that is Women and Children Hospital, Kuala Lumpur. He was the second vice president of the Asia Australasian Society of Neurological Surgeons, and he is also the member of the Neuroendoscopy Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgery societies. He is an integral part of the ACNS and he is an executive editor of the AJNS. He has been strongly behind us as a guiding force throughout our journey in this educational venture of the ACNS. We are extremely honored to have him today and also grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Baldaf. To chair for the second session of today is our honored guest and senior faculty from Chile, Professor Jorge Mura. Professor Mura is the professor of neurosurgery at the University of Chile. He is the chief of cerebrovascular and skull based division of the Department of Neurosurgery Institute of Neurosurgery, Asenjo. He is also the president elect of the Chilean Neurosurgery Society, and his research and clinical interests are focused upon open skull base and cerebrovascular surgery. He is a noted academician with, and a profession surgeon who has published several articles in various peer reviewed international journals. We are extremely honored and grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Eduardo Vieira. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Katu, I would like to welcome all the speakers, chairs, and the distinguished audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this virtual podium to our first chair, Professor Azmi Elias. Thank you very much, uh, Raja Kuti, for your kind introduction. And I would like to congratulate you for this uh, very wonderful continuous effort. And I think many people following the ACNS uh, webinar. And this is non-stop since two years ago, since we had this pandemic. This is a very beautiful platform. And it is my uh, great honor and pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Jacques Baldauf from the University of Griswold, uh, Germany. So he will talk about uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy techniques, indication, pitfall, and complication. So the podium is yours, Professor Jacques Baldauf. Thank you for this nice introduction. And it's a great honor for me to be a part of this uh, lecture in Germany this afternoon. So I think we live in different times, of course. I was asked to, to talk about um, some special uh, topic which might be interesting for residents and for already uh, experienced neurosurgeons. So I thought the endoscopic third ventriculostomy is still of interest in our community. And I think uh, especially for yeah, some young neurosurgeons and, and also for neurosurgeons who are uh, work with hydrocephalic, hydrocephalic patients, the endoscopic treatment is still interesting. So I think I talk about basic uh, basics about the technique, some indications, of course, I have to uh, share my experience with complications with you. And uh, I will try to talk about some pitfalls and uh, several things to know and to um, yeah, to some things have to mention in this uh, uh, kind of topic. The principle of the third ventriculostomy seems to be very easy. You want to create the bypass because if the CSF passage is closed somewhere uh, uh, from the aqueduct and downwards, you get uh, the problem of the hydrocephalus. And the basic principle is to create a bypass or to create a stoma 
in front of the uh, mammillary bodies uh, and in front of the brainstem to open this part uh, of the floor of the third ventricle to leave out the CSF and to give the CSF the chance to find a new way downwards to the spinal canal and uh, to resolve a hydrocephalus. So of course you have to do a bar hole, you have to pass the foramen of Monroe, you have to visualize the floor of the third ventricle and the third ventricle itself. And then you have to find the right place to puncture the floor of the third ventricle and to open the ventricle to the basal cisterns. So it seems quite easy. And uh, of course, several, several companies offer already some kind of endoscopes and endoscopic technique to realize this kind of, of surgery for the neurosurgeon. I know there are several companies, of course, like Escolab and so on, and we are used to use a Storz endoscope. This uh, you can see here, but the basic principles are always the same. You have a working channel, you have the endoscope itself, you have to, uh, um, yeah, to, to connect it with the camera system, with the light source and so on. You see here on this kind of endoscope, this, uh, this uh, small tubes on both sides. One means one is the inflow channel, one is the outflow channel. In the middle, you see the, the main working channel for the instruments to put in and to create the hole and for, for several uh, other functions, of course. But this is already what you have to use during the surgery, the, the easy endoscope. We have different sizes. Of course, this is not so important because uh, this uh, is quite different from, from uh, the device to device between the companies. You have, of course, the working channel, you have the, the light source and the camera channel. So this is always similar. There are several options to, to fix the endoscope. We use in Kreisler this kind of holding device as a pneumatic arm. Of course, you have different options. You have mechanical arms. Uh, we all we used in the early years the typical Lila arm, and we fixed the endoscope to a Lila arm. And uh, on the other hand, you can use an assistant uh, doctor, like a resident or someone who can fix it with the hand itself. Uh, so several options to fix the endoscope within the brain. Of course, uh, when you do the surgery, you always have to be somehow mobile to run from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricles and to the floor and so on. And to move within the ventricular system, you have to lose the endoscope always. But I think this kind is clear and I will uh, show you later on some videos and some images as well. Uh, what I want to mention is that in some cases, uh, I think neural navigation might be quite useful even for uh, uh, cases, or especially for cases with multi-loculated hydrocephalus, the neural navigation might be uh, useful if you are, uh, if you, if you have one um, for you to work with. But I think in many, many cases, neural navigation is not necessary. In the typical hydrocephalic patient, you don't need a neural navigation system because uh, in our experience in Greifswald, we have, I think, I think around four, six, seven hundred um, uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomies done. We use the navigation uh, very rarely, and then the typical hydrocephalic patient, we, we don't use it. So it's not really as necessary. The main indication uh, for this procedure, I think, is the occlusive hydrocephalus. And of course, there are several reasons. Uh, who produce this kind of occlusion uh, of the CSF pathways. And uh, the most thankful patient, uh, especially when you start with the procedure, is a patient with a typical aqueductal stenosis. Because uh, especially in, in patients who are not young anymore on adults, if you have a decompensated aqueductal stenosis, you have dilated uh, uh, ventricles. In many cases, you have some kind of a chronic uh, dilation of the ventricles. And sometimes there's a decompensation in these kind of patients when the aqueductally 
ducted is finally closed. And these patients have, of course, for the first time you have, you can identify the intraventricular structures very well. You see a lot, you have a lot of space and this is quite good uh, to start with. When do we see an occlusified hydrocephalus also, of course, and many kind of few more patients uh, uh, you can, uh, or these patients can be uh, um, yeah, related um, or connected with the hydrocephalus as well, especially when the tumor is located in the posterior part of the third ventricle with occlusion of the aqueduct, or sometimes when you have a tumor that is closely uh, related to the fourth ventricle and also to the lower part of the aqueduct in the posterior fossa, then tumors may occlude the CSF pathway. And so, of course, you have an occlusive hydrocephalus. What is rare, uh, we have also some experience in some cases with a cerebellar infarct and the cerebellar swelling and resulting with a hydrocephalus. Also, hemorrhage uh, can happen. And of course, there are some other um, diagnoses. They might be more rarely happen then you can uh, use it also. I'm not convinced that the communicating hydrocephalus is a good reason for an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, therefore, we, we do not uh, use this technique in communicating hydrocephalus anymore. Of course, we tried, and uh, maybe some of you know that uh, um, some colleagues use the, this technique also in normal pressure hydrocephalus. I think this is um, not a good, good indication. Of course, we had uh, some kind of patients where we tried this also, but I'm not convinced. But this is open for discussion, of course. What is important when you start with the technique? Of course, you have to check uh, the images. And we prefer... Uh, MR imaging and some special sequences, if possible, of course. Of course, on the axial view, you always see a dilation of the ventricles. But I think what is quite important to look at the lateral view of the T2 images. And uh, we prefer this cis sequence, the constructive interferred in steady state um, sequence, because, because these slices are very, very close, very thin slices, and you get a very nice anatomical overview of the region of interest. And if you look here on the right image on the cis sequence, you see very nicely the membranes. And what is important, you can see how the floor of the third ventricle and the third ventricle um, is uh, configured. Configured. You see, and this is a typical patient with an aqueductal stenosis. You see very nicely the ampulla of the aqueduct is widened and enlarged. And there is a stop uh, close to the fourth ventricle where the aqueduct uh, stenosis is obviously seen. What can you also see? You see and you recognize the bulging of the floor of the third ventricle. It means the floor of the third ventricle is pushed, pushed downwards um, in well, close to the basal cisterns. And um, you see uh, also the laminar terminalis and everything. Everything is very, very plump, is bulged. So you don't have sharp contours. And these are typical signs for uh, an hydrocephalus with an aqueductal stenosis. What you see also in the, uh, in the, on the image at the midline, if you use this so-called IRTSA sequence, um, this is a inversion recovery a sequence that demonstrate you, uh, or the, this kind of uh, image should demonstrate the flow uh, of the CSF in and to the aqueduct, and you see here very nicely, there's no flow, no, nothing to find and to see within this kind of sequence, it means there's a stop of the CSF passage through the aqueduct. Uh, these kind of sequences 
I think might help you to make your decision also and to decide, okay, I do the endoscopic cell frangiculostomy. This kind of sequence is a sine phase contrast sequence also for demonstrating the flow. Um, in this kind of uh, uh, sequence here, we don't see any kind of flow uh, within the aqueduct you see in the prepontine system, some flow signal, but uh, later on I'll show you some um, images of a patient pre and post-op, and then you can also see for, uh, or that the flow sign is quite important for follow-up and for the, um, yeah, for the um, evaluation after surgery, if or whether the stoma is open or not. So I switch over to the technique itself and really start with some basic things that are very important, I think. The selection of approach. Where could we uh, put the borehole into the, into the skull, of course. I think everybody knows the Kocher point um, for the uh, you know, insertion of the external ventricular drainage and um, the selection of the approach for the endoscopic third ventriculostomy is quite, quite similar. So we go a little bit lateral from the midline close to the coronary suture, around maybe two to three centimeters lateral and at least one centimeter uh, in front uh, of the coronary suture. This is a typical point um, for putting in the, the yeah, um, external ventricular drain into the CSF in the acute situation uh, to resolve hydrocephalus and many, many different, or for many, many different reasons. And of course, I think this is a, uh, a good point uh, to do the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, of course. Uh, what I should mention is, um, it is very important not only to look uh, on the MR images to evaluate the configuration of the third ventricle, no. Also, it's very important to estimate the size of the foramen of Monroe because we have different kind of endoscopes uh, that we want to put in uh, uh, to the ventricle. And of course, you have to pass the foramen of Monroe when you want to do this ETV. And therefore, it's important to estimate somehow uh, whether the foramen of Monroe is large or very small, because this is a reason also to check whether you um, uh, put the 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 borehole right pre-coronal or a little bit more frontal, a little bit backwards. And in some cases, when the anatomy is somehow a little bit disturbed and when the foramen of Monroe is quite small then also sometimes you could put the borehole uh, right on the coronary suture, sometimes very close behind. But in these cases, when it becomes a little bit more difficult, and uh, then I think neural navigation uh, is quite useful to guide you and to show you the best direction to come uh, to the floor, to the third ventricle. But in general, in the normal cases, I think uh, this kind of Kocher point, uh, lateral 2.5 centimeters pre-coronal borehole, this is the right point um, for uh, going into the lateral ventry. As I mentioned with the foramen of Monroe, you see here also these kind of images. Um, there are sometimes a special situation. Uh, maybe we have some uh, occlusion of the aqueduct and the reason is a tumor that is uh, closely related to the pineal region or within the aqueduct or maybe like a tectal glioma and so on. In some cases, when maybe a pineal tumor is uh, occluding the aqueduct, then it might be also of interest to take a biopsy. Uh, later on, I show also a video, I think, because 
if you try to do or to combine the procedures, especially in these cases, it's very important to estimate the size uh, of the foramen of Monroe because a rotation or if you want to, to turn back the endoscope to visualize the third uh, or to visualize the posterior part of the third ventricle, then it might be dangerous. And uh, when you have a very small uh, foramen of Monroe, then you can injure uh, the, the, the fornix and so on. So this is quite important. And therefore some uh, colleagues and also we would recommend if you, if you have a very small foramen of Monroe, if you plan the ETV to resolve for hydrocephalus, if you plan a biopsy, in some rare cases, it's useful to put uh, two bell holes, one with a tra trajectory um, more to the aqueduct, more frontal, and for the ETV, uh, as I told you uh, before. But of course, in general, um, you need only one bell hole for a typical ventriculostomy. This is what we see in a very uh, nice patient, maybe with an aqueduct stenosis, you see the floor of the third ventricle here. And uh, now it's interesting where to put the stoma or where to open the floor of the third ventricle. So before you have to recognize the uh, important and uh, yeah, anatomical structures like the mammillary bodies here, um, as mentioned, what you always see in the normal patient is the infundibular recess, this red spot. It's located frontal, of course. Uh, and then if the floor is uh, translucent, you can see or may see the basilar artery also, at least uh, the head, the upper part of the basilar artery. In some cases, is nicely visible. So this is also a very important point because the injury to the basilar injury, uh, basilar uh, artery would be very, very, very dangerous uh, because of course you can, you can uh, get a zipacnoid hemorrhage and so on. And another point, this is the location of the clivus. And where should we now put the, the fenestration? Uh, right in the midline between the infundibular recess and the mammary bodies, right in the midline. And sometimes if you see the clivus, you can uh, push it a little bit into the direction of the clivus. So the opening of the floor can be done in different ways. We use a special forceps uh, that is uh, designed by Philippe Deck uh, from France. And uh, of course you can use some kind of bipolar electrodes. Some uh, colleagues uh, told me that you that they run uh, to the floor to the third ventricle with the endoscopic tip itself, if it's quite uh, small and several options. But I think the, the important thing is to locate the anatomical structures to be sure where you put the borehole, uh, not the borehole, the fenestration uh, of the floor of the third ventricle to avoid any uh, dramatic complications. The steps here again, with some images on the left upper corner, you see the, we are in the lateral ventricle in the frontal horn. You see never very nicely the foramen of Monroe, very nicely um, the choroid plexus um, to the midline, the septal vein and the thalamus triad vein. And in the depths, already the mammillary bodies and the floor of the third ventricle. When we pass the, the foramen of Monroe, it's very important to preserve the fornix and not to damage the fornix. And then you pass the, the foramen of Monroe and you see here again, the floor, these typical structures, infundibular recess, uh, then the mammillary bodies. And the floor is a little bit translucent. Again, this is the kind of forceps we use. You put, we put a small and tiny fenestration at the floor. And then, of course, you want to, 
to to widen to enlarge this kind of fenestration and therefore we use the Fogarty balloon as can be seen in the left uh, lower image and with the inflation of this uh, Fogarty balloon inside this fenestration site there we can open uh, and enlarge the, the stoma up to I think around four to six millimeters in the middle you see there is this kind of opening and I think it's very important after you uh, you enlarged the stoma to visualize and to look into the prepontine area uh, and during or here on these typical images you see this is the basilar artery and some very, very tiny and small arachnoid membranes. But especially when you have children or you have an atypical situation, you may find uh, a lot of um, arachnoid membranes, or liliquist membrane. And I think especially in some, some children sometimes, um, the procedure might be not successful because um, there are arachnoid membranes that, membranes that have not uh, been opened during the procedure. And um, we had also some cases where we came back with a second ETV, especially when we started, or my colleagues started in the early 90s uh, with the procedure. And now we always check whether the uh, arachnoid membranes uh, are quite open and the CSF uh, can run to the prepoint time system very easily and everything is open. This I think has to be has to be checked. This is again now the video itself. Mm. Typical situation you see this kind of uh, the, 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 the floor of the third ventricle that is pushed somehow you see here the sheath we use the sheath of the endoscope as a retractor to make sure that we don't hurt and injure the, um, uh, the fornix. You see very nicely, yeah, now the floor of the third ventricle and what I told you, we use the kind of, uh, it's called deck forceps to open uh, or to puncture the floor, to open it uh, in the early stage to make the fenestration and this forceps uh, gives us a chance to, to make uh, a small dilation already. And then the Fogarty balloon, inflation. We always fill up the Fogarty balloon with some saline, uh, so water, to make the balloon a little bit more uh, easier to inflate and deflate. If there's only air inside, there's a kind of pop-up effect and you cannot control uh, uh, the balloon when or in comparison with this kind of yeah, fluid filled balloon. So you can gentle inflate and deflate the balloon also in the prepontine area and you see a tiny membrane below this the floor is already open. You see a very very small bleeding. This kind of bleedings resolve by itself in many cases. And this is a view into the prepontine system. You see normal membranic situation, no uh, uh, thick membranes, no closure. And after the procedure, you see very nicely the, the floor of the third ventricle, uh, third ventricle is like a sail in the wind. So it's a good sign, especially in uh, occlusive hydrocephalus. And we always check when we uh, take out the endoscope whether the puncture channel is free of blood uh, to make sure is a nice situation also after the procedure. As I told you, we always check the image, images. Also, you see the typical aqueductal stenosis in the upper part uh, and then you may have a look at the Urza sequence. This is uh, the sequence in the midline. 
you see on the upper image, there's no fly flow sign anywhere. It means the aqueduct is closed. And after doing the ETV, you see this black flow sign in front of the ponds running to from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle and to the stoma. This black flow sign is a typical sign that the stoma works and the stoma is open. And even in follow up, when we check our patients, uh, we have some patients we check now for more than 10, 15 years, and we always do the MR images. And of course, the clinical status of the patient is quite important, uh, that's for sure. But when we follow up our images, we look at the C sequence, you also see a small opening uh, at the floor of the third ventricle, and we always do this kind of flow um, imaging to make sure, okay, the stoma is still open even after 10, 15, and so on years. Now, this is a typical um, example, or you probably, all of you know from your, from your clinical practice, you see sometimes tumors that uh, close the aqueduct and produce an hydrocephalus. And uh, this is uh, the situation uh, where you are, um, think about doing the endoscopic third ventriculostomy to resolve um, the hydrocephalus. And of course, in some cases, you want to take a biopsy. Uh, this is what we also do. And uh, as I told you, you have to check the foramen of Monroe, and then you can combine those procedures. You see here, we are already, uh, this is prepontine area, the ETV has been done, and then we have to turn the endoscope a little bit backwards to rotate sometimes, and then we can nicely visualize the posterior part of the third ventricle. Uh, and now the tumor comes in our view. This is a tumor, part of the tumor of the pineal region. The aqueduct is below and is also occluded by the tumor. And of course, in this kind of patient, if possible, you can nicely take a biopsy also. But of course, you see the aqueduct is somehow uh, a little bit uh, open but not uh, functioning as it should. So the ETV, of course, is a good decision and to combine everything. What are the limitations? And um, especially when you start with a procedure and you have no, not so many experience, uh, limitations are quite important because if the situation is nice and if the patient um, demonstrates you a typical normal hydrocephalus without any, any uh, anatomical limitations or any anatomical abnormalities, then everything is easy. Then it's a good uh, straightforward procedure. But uh, I think, especially in some countries, um, uh, and I think uh, many of you have seen more complicated cases, than we've seen because we, have, we rarely see uh, very, um, very uh, complicated things because it's rare, um, then um, it's very important to look at the images and to get an idea of what you will find during your surgery. This is a typical big foramen of Monroe where you have a lot of space in this kind of uh, surgery, you see this is already after ETV, mammary bodies, you can look through the foramen of mono into the aqueduct, you see the posterior commissure. So there's a lot of space for manipulation. This is easy. But here you see it's a very small and tiny uh, foramen of mono. So it's not so easy. You have to pass the foramen. You want to preserve the, the fornix. Uh, this is uh, somehow not so easy anymore. The trajectory uh, for the procedure 
should really be the right one should fit and maybe um, yeah you could use the navigation as well. We have a special device. This is some kind of a blunt troca we can put inside um, and zero degree optic, uh, and we can with this blunt tip go to the to the foramen of Monroe that we uh, widen it a little bit, but uh, a cut of the fornix is quite uncommon. And uh, the floor of the third one trigger can look very different, especially when you have some cases with infection or after hemorrhage, or when you have some patient with um, uh, anatomic variance, anomalies, and so on. The, below on the left corner, this is a patient with, uh, with an infection. So you cannot really easily recognize where the structures are. Uh, and in the upper right corner, this is after an intraventricular hemorrhage uh, and then hydrocephalus. On the other hand, you see very nicely on the left, uh, on the right lower corner, you see almost everything. Uh, you see the basilar artery, you see the brainstem, you see um, the, um, the clivus and so on. And uh, so that looks uh, quite, uh, quite easily for doing this kind of surgery. What, uh, this is a patient, uh, I've uh, done the ETV several years ago and I, I really didn't look um, sophisticatedly <laughs> to the images before. And when I went into the third ventricle, I've seen this structure as a kind of an interhypothalamic adhesion, it seems to be very rare. I uh, looked at the literature and found maybe one, two, three cases. This is not, not the massa intermedia. And um, I think the massa intermedia is not so important because uh, this is not a crossing of important fibers. I talked to our anatomical uh, colleagues and they said, if you, if you open the massa intermedia, if you uh, yeah, destroy the massa intermedia, this should be not a problem. But with this kind of adhesion here or connection between the hypothalamic areas of both sides, I, oh, I really preserved it and went very, very close behind this for an opening. So there are several things um, you may experience during uh, this kind of uh, surgery and when you go inside. This is another uh, example. Um, this is a patient um, with multiple surgeries, um, several operations uh, after an oligodendroglioma. And even here, it was possible to do an ETV only for palliative um, reasons because she um, deteriorated due to the hydrocephalus. Um, and we only decided not to put in a shunt, but. Um, but uh, we did an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And you see here, this is this kind of patient. Uh, this is a typical situation for Raymond Monroe. Um, and um, the choroid plexus, again, the sheath will be used as a retractor. And you see now that the tumor or part of the tumor as expected, as expected uh, is within the third ventricle. And now there is a seeding of two more parts uh, everywhere within the third ventricle and the location uh, for putting in the fenestration or to, to locate the right fenestration site is not so easy anymore. So there was the clivus. <clears throat> And the uh, tumor was also uh, very in the um, very close to the infundibular recess. And as I showed you, this is um, this is a pre-op image, the CT scan, and here <clears throat> post-op. But there, it's not so easy. Uh, another point of um, to mention is what I told you earlier, after 
you do the endoscopic side ventriculostomy, we have to check always uh, the basal systems. And in this kind of patient, you see very nicely that we have a lot of membranes, a lot of uh, arachnoid layers uh, that occlude the CSF passage in the prepontine area. So it is very important to open these kind of membranes to make sure that you can get uh, a nice connection between the ventricular system and the basal cisterns. So Lilliquist membrane is an important part to, to check. All in all, in the occlusive hydrocephalic patient, in our experience, uh, we had a nice or a good success rate, about 80 to 90%. And if you compare this with the international literature, um, it's quite similar. When you uh, really choose the right and uh, good patient, then I think this is achievable. We have complications. And also here, I think if you look at the literature, it's between zero and 20%. Uh, Henry Schröder, my, my chairman, he started with Professor Garb in the early 90s uh, with the third ventriculostomy and he published a paper, I think in 2002 about complications. And I think we had complications around um, 10, a little bit more percent. But uh, you should uh, be aware of transient complications. And of course, uh, very bad complications or permanent complications. And especially in the early years, when the Greifswald uh, uh, neurosurgery started, we had in the early 90s, uh, two patients uh, who died um, as yeah, in combination with this kind of procedure. And we had one um, lethal subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, there was an injury during the surgery to um, the perforating artery uh, that was related to the basilar uh, artery. This case was also published by Henry Schroeder, I think, at the end of the 90s. And we think, and I think, this kind of complication is, is underreported in the literature somehow. Because if you don't stay close to the midline, if you go to too far backwards with the fenestration, you really carry the risk uh, of damage to um, small arteries or um, yeah, perforating arteries that are connected to the basilar artery. So I think this is uh, something really important and to mention that a fatal hemorrhage can occur and uh, you have the risk if you don't stay to the right anatomical structures. Uh, we had a second patient uh, in the 90s, and this patient uh, developed a meningitis, a bad meningitis, and um, uh, he died also uh, related to the procedure, but not to any mechanical problems, but to infection. But if we talk, and if I talk about complications, um, uh, I want to show you this kind of image of a thalamic contusion is also an image uh, that we experienced here more than I think 15 years ago. Um, my colleague uh, did not check really the anatomical landmarks and uh, he, um, he landed, ended up with the endoscope with a contusion in the thalamus. And what we always do before we put in the endoscope into the lateral ventricle, we puncture with the, with the Cushing canoe. It was a small, tiny canoe, probably uh, many of you know this, so a tube or like an EVD, of course, to make sure that we are in a ventricular system. And then we follow this, uh, this uh, path um, and then we end up in the ventricle. But this is one case uh, that should uh, remember us that we have to stay close to this direction. We have to really keep to the direction and not to pr produce 
such kind of problem. And this is sometimes the reason for some colleagues, uh, they say, oh, we do every ETV connected to the neural navigation, but I think in general, it is not necessary. Uh, this is another complication, quite unusual. Uh, if you look at the images, this patient has a small tumor closing the, uh, closing the aqueduct and the hydrocephalus. In this patient, we combined also, um, this is also more than 10 years ago, we combined the ETV and we wanted to, to take a biopsy. Finally, the biopsy was not really necessary, but the foramen of Monroe was big, so this was not the problem. But you see on the upper right image, the CT scan, we have this swelling of the thalamus on the right side. So finally, um, one day after surgery, she developed a hemiparesis and we did the CT scan and we've seen this. So the only explanation we have is, and I have is, that um, during the rotation of the endoscope, during the visualization of the posterior part of the third ventricle, I think there was a compression of the thalamus triad vein. And on the lower image left, there's a suspected, uh, yeah, suspected problem with the thalamus triad vein. So we think maybe there was some kind of thrombosis in this vein and the venous congestion resulted in this swelling and with this hemiparesis. This is really the one and only case from in this kind of, with this kind of problem we have during the last uh, almost 30 years. Quite unusual, but sometimes it may happen. This is another um, case that worth to show you, I think, that was a young woman, 24 years, I think, with an aqueductal stenosis when she came the first time. And uh, we performed an ETV, everything was fine. And uh, for many years. And then um, after, I don't know, two, three, four years, she came back. And that was the image when she came back. We've seen, you see the, very nicely the coronary view, and you see there is a coronal the stenosis of both foramen and monmo after the ETV, because the third ventricle is very narrow. You've seen the dilated lateral ventricles, and she came with, with, uh, yeah, with um, decrease of consciousness and headache and vomiting. And then we decided, okay, we plan the foraminum plasty. But um, here you see, you see on the right side, the perforation of the septum that was already there um, during the first procedure, you see here, this is the foramen of Monroe, is closed. You see the typical structure of the choroid plexus. And especially again for the younger surgeon, if you get lost in a lateral ventricle, and if you see the choroid plexus, follow the choroid plexus uh, into frontal direction, and then you find the foramen of Monroe. Here, the foramen of Monroe is closed. There was a small membrane, but still it's very, very narrow. You see here the Fogarty catheter that is also very small. So um, finally, we decided not uh, to inflate the balloon, what you do sometimes in a foraminoplasty, but we decided to put in a stand. So we gently uh, enlarged the, the foramen of one row. This is a view into the very narrow uh, third ventricle. And finally, we put in the stent. Uh, you see on the lower left corner also the remnant of the stent that runs from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle and almost ends up in the former uh, ventriculostomy. And she is still uh, without any problem, problems now for more than 10 years. And I think this is also an unusual uh, complication. So we also looked at the uh, videos 
from the uh, from the first procedure and there we've seen already okay the foramen of monroe is was very narrow but of course patent okay how to avoid complications location of the basal artery blunt perforation um, no scissors no laser rigid hopkins and then you can place the ventricular semi very accurate Finally, I want to present maybe some short cases, maybe for discussion, because there's always a discussion uh, for children below one, two, three years. And that was a case and this uh, girl came with three months of age, second degree aqueduct aqueductal stenosis. That was the MR images, uh, MR image typical signs, then we did the third ventriculostomy, you see what you, in many of these cases see, the subtural effusion, but this is not a problem, and um, that results over the years. Then uh, after two, two years, again, the patient came back with the closure of the stoma, okay, so we decided again to do a third ventriculostomy. You see here on the upper left, this is the closure, what we've seen before we did the re-ETV. Uh, a lot of membranes in the prepontine uh, area after surgery. This is a typical flow sign, a strong flow sign to the prepontine area. Everything went fine. But finally, she come, came back with another closure and then uh, uh, we put in the shunt to resolve the hydrocephalus. What I want to say is, Especially in young children, um, the reclosure rate is much higher or is really high. So, and if you look at the literature, especially in these young, below you know, one year, uh, six months, uh, it's around maybe 50% or less success rate. Many of these children, most of the children, receive finally a chunk in this age. This is another example. That was a 22-year-old male, and she, or he was treated uh, in another institution, and that was the MR image, what they've seen uh, when they treated him first time. This is typical aqueductal stenosis, and uh, then, but they didn't uh, really recognize. So the ventricular size increased, and then they put in a shunt, um, it's very popular, of course, to put in some programmable, programmable waves. And this patient experienced the problem with over drainage and under drainage. And finally, he sent me the images and we decided, okay, it's a typical aqueductal stenosis. So we, um, um, we took out the shunt and before, uh, we did the endoscopic third ventricular stomy, and finally he was was fine, and uh, now he has this normal configured uh, uh, ventricular system. He he's not uh, having a shunt anymore. This typical flow sign again. Okay. In conclusion, I think uh, endoscopy is a therapy of choice if available for. CSF pathways obstruction and this might be the gold standard in obstructive hydrocephalus. I think we have now more than 20 years uh, experience with the procedure and I think many other colleagues have this experience also. And um, now I want to finish and thank you uh, for, for being a part of this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any Dr. questions? Yes, Dr. Razmi, your expert comments. Okay, thank you very much. I enjoy your presentation right from the beginning because you come uh, from a very established center, Professor Henry Schroeder, Professor Gap. So I really yes. admire uh, your work. And you highlight a very, uh, very many important uh, aspects, uh, especially at the beginning, you mentioned that uh, you should uh, estimate the size of the foramen of Monroe. So uh, this is very crucial because uh, most of the people, even for experts, uh, especially for beginners, 
uh, not only need to know the anatomy of the ventricle, but also anatomy of the endoscope itself. So uh, in order for you to know the size of the mono, you also need to know the size of the endoscope and the orientation. This is so important because endoscope, uh, intraventricular procedure, they have many working channels. If the mono is too small, uh, even you can manage to go through, but if your irrigation in doesn't go out, and then the, the irrigation will trap into the third ventricle that can suddenly increase the ICP, then that can cause a problem to the patient. So that is a very important. And uh, also sometimes, uh, you know, uh, you need to know the orientation of the endoscope. Uh, you need to know where is the, the, the working instrument come out. You know, it should be from in front, it could be from below because different endoscope design have a different orientation. Yeah, uh, for example, like Minop, we have a very small 1.4 millimeter working channel from uh, on top, but for uh, stores, they have slightly larger elongated, you know, so they can move a little bit. Um, so that is uh, what I, I learned. And it also, uh, and, and the video surgery, uh, before they start everything, because when, when especially for beginners, ETV, they rush to make a stoma. So they forget to check about the bipolar, they forget to check about the balloon, you know, sometimes when they insert the balloon already ruptured. So this is a very basic thing. So uh, I am happy that you highlight uh, that. Uh, and, and, and and the other thing is that uh, you also share some very rare but uh, interesting complication that I thought could never happen. But uh, for example, like the thalamic impact. And uh, you also highlight a very important thing that the thalamus ribbon is uh, could be one of the Factor contribute to that maybe the scope you know uh, lean on this uh, on the thalamus raven as you uh, mobilize and uh, doing things uh, in the third ventricle. So this is very important uh, to highlight because sometimes when we start to do our work in the floor of the third ventricle, we forget what is behind, you know. So the scope actually uh, hitting on that. So this is a uh, very uh, important to highlight to prevent such a complication which is very rare happen. But uh, uh, I think I appreciate that you share with this. And also Basila tip. Yeah? Uh, could happen even in the expert end, especially if you use monopolar, especially if the prepontine space are very narrow. Eh? If you have a posterior prostatima, for example, you push the brain stem towards the thyroid, yeah? the prepontine space are narrowed. But that doesn't matter because you also highlight that sometimes you can do it towards the thyroid. Uh, usually what I did, uh, I make a small perforation and then let the CSF goes into the prefrontal space and slowly it will expand. Then only you proceed with your proper, uh, you know, ETB is a balloon technique. And the other, thing, uh, the other thing is you mentioned about the location in terms of the perfect for ETB. I, I agree with you. And in most of the cases, uh, especially gross hydrocephalus, you can use a pre coronable hole about one centimeter. Uh, usually I use a mid papery line as my landmark. Uh, but for the procedure that you need to do ETV and biopsy, so uh, uh, I advocate a technique that I learned from our late Professor Pernesky. So he actually make a, a, a hole slightly in front, uh, like incorporating the two behold, but with one. Yeah, and sometimes uh, he did elongated behold, yeah, so that uh, you actually accommodating the movement. But what I did, uh, I did a pre coronal hole, mid papillary line, and I did an ETV usual way. But when I do a biopsy, I rotate the endoscope like that. You know, but you have to be familiar because if you don't, yeah. you do not familiar, sometimes very difficult for you to do uh, a biopsy. So uh, these are among the things that um, I pick up and I also uh, like your presentation. But I have a couple uh, questions, uh, very basic. Uh, what about the incision uh, uh, for the burr hole? You do a linear incision, you make a flap, do you put a Omaya reservoir, and then you make a flap on the pericranium, and how do you repair uh, the defect following the ETB? This is a very basic question that most of the beginners uh, like to know because they only see the scope and the stoma, they forget about the skin and how to repair it. So, John. Yeah. So uh, I think what you said uh, about the technique and so on is very right. So I think we are very similar. And the skin incision, of course, 
it really depends on the surgeon. Uh, I usually do a small flap because I think so the whole, the whole is a little bit covered, uh, a little bit better covered. But I know some uh, colleagues do also a straight skin incision, very short. And even here in our department, I, I think it really doesn't matter. But what we do uh, when we, before closure, uh, we put a, a thick piece of gel foam into this uh, burr hole to cover it a little bit. And in general, this is enough. We, it's very rare that we put uh, or that we leave Omaya Reservoir. We do it sometimes, but it's not in the regular patient, only in some patients where we think, okay, that might be, however, a little bit unsafe to leave everything open. Yeah, maybe in a tumor patient or after a hemorrhage, then we may leave in very, very rare situations in Nomaya Reservoir because it's very rare that we have this kind of problem, even in EVD. Uh, some colleagues say they always leave an external drain for at least for one night and they close it. Uh, this is what we, uh, I, I don't remember any patient where we did this. And uh, some, some are afraid of, uh, of a CSF leakage or something. I think in most of the cases, this is not a problem. And even if you have a small subcutaneous effusion, it resolves after several days uh, by itself. So I think this is not a problem. So we only put gel foam in skin decision. Finally, I think it depends a little bit on you. I do a very small flap just for my feeling to cover this uh, hole a little bit better. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Raja, uh, yes, the, the, the questions in the chat box are, in cases of cerebellar infarct or bleed, do you advocate third ventriculostomy over external ventricular drain? If, if there is a cerebellar infarct and the use of the ETV? Yes. Do you prefer uh, ETV this, over the external ventricular drain? Yeah, it really depends. It really depends on the kind of the infarct in, in the... Uh, in the individual situations. If you have a cerebellar infarct in the spelling of maybe a cerebellar hemisphere, and this is, there's only uh, occlusion of the aqueduct, and you can estimate the prepontine area, and the prepontine area looks quite fine, then we do in these kind of cases uh, an ETV. If you see a massive swelling uh, and you see there is no space in the prepontine area, I would never recommend an ETV. This is very individually. And if you have, uh, if you see the patient and if um, maybe there's, there's only, uh, only a problem of an hydrocephalic uh, situation in, in the brain, then, uh, and the prepontine system is free and it's only the occlusion of your aqueduct, then you can do it. If you see it's a massive swelling, then I would always recommend to uh, solve the problem with the craniotomy and uh, section of the uh, damaged brain. And we, uh, especially with regard to this kind of problem, we published a paper, I think 2006 or 2007 or somewhere, uh, then we, we wrote down our experience with, with around 10 or 12 patients with cerebellar infarct, but it really has to be estimated individually. You have to check prepontine cistern kind of swelling. Thank you very much. Yes, Professor Jorge Mura wants to ask a question, Professor Mura. Yes, I want to ask to the professor, what did, what, what, what did he think about the MTB, the microsurgical third ventriculostomy opening the lamina terminalis? Because uh, when you use the lamina terminalis, it, it doesn't matter the prepontine cistern, it doesn't matter the, the thickness of the liliquist because you open with microsurgical instruments and you connect the posterior fossa with the supratentorial um, cistern. Even you, you don't care about the, the, 
the size of the ventricles because uh, uh, you can open the anterior wall. You, do you have any experience uh, in this surgery? Um, no, we, we don't do this. We only do the opening of the lamina terminalis in cases of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and related hydrocephalus. Then we do it, of course. In the regular patient, maybe within um, tumor-related hydrocephalus or with, uh, with an acridocus stenosis, we don't have experience. Of course, we know how to open the lamina terminalis, of course, yes, but we do it in, uh, in patient with hydrocephalus and subarachnoid hemorrhage, then we do it, of course. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Eisner. Can I ask Raja one question, QQ? Okay, that was a wonderful lecture, uh, Professor Barlock. A couple of questions, you know, suppose you stray uh, in the floor of the third ventricle too lateral, have you seen patients developing a third nerve palsy? And second thing you told that, you know, uh, say a normal pressure hydrocephalus, it is not an indication. But, you know, I have read in literature the symptomatic uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus means uh, these patients are uh, secondary normal pressure or radiopathic normal pressure or symptomatic uh, long standing over hydrocephalus. These patients, when they uh, start having on and off headache, if you do third ventriculostomy, they get uh, better. Your comments and also what are the various causes for stoma pressure in infants under three years of age? Uh, Professor Balanoff, for your comments. Thank you for the question. I think you is very, very important. And this is, I missed during my talk, the third nerve palsy. This is very important because if you don't stay close to the midline and you go too lateral, you, you carry the risk of third nerve palsy. And I know um, my colleagues, uh, Professor Garb and Henry Schroeder, in the early 90s, there was one case in the department with a third nerve palsy. And this is quite important because it's completely right. If you don't stay to the midline, you go far lateral, you carry the risk of the third nerve uh, palsy. And this is sometimes, especially when there is a little bit distorted anatomy, we look in the prepentine area, we look around with an yeah, inspection optic and look whether the nerve is, uh, where the nerve is and if the nerve is still, still okay. So this is a complication. I think this is common, it's rare, but it's uh, important to know. And the other question was about the longstanding hydrocephalus and normal pressure, yes, uh, for the communicating. So I think, and we are not convinced, um, that it works. I know there was the Brazilian study uh, some years ago, they uh, published, um, I don't remember how many patients, but I, I think they had a good success rate. But there was still the discussion about this paper. And of course, we had to check this also. You're completely right, because some colleagues say it should work and it may work. So we created a study that is not published yet. Um, in our department and compared, of course, um, um, the normal pressure hydrocephalic patient, we did, I don't know, a lot of uh, ETVs, the normal pressure, and um, we my, didn't. My, we last did find. my last question was causes of stoma closure in infants below three months of age, other than infection. Other than infection, you find it, and uh, they don't have proper arachnoid villi to absorb also. So is there any other cause why the stoma gets closed fast? In, in yeah, terms so have, Yes, this is, this is what we also experience with the children below three years of age, especially in infection. We had, I think, almost none of these patients benefit from the ETV. Most of them become a shunt. And therefore, I would always recommend, especially if you have a child with infection or hemorrhage, that the shunt is the first choice uh, of treatment. Uh, and uh, I think also this is a very, very important point. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. For thank you. Thank you thank very you. much, Professor Suresh Nair. Indeed, it was a very wonderful lecture. I would like to ask him a couple of few questions we'll, before we move on to the second session. These are basic questions like, what is the irrigation fluid that you would choose in your cases? Is it saline use, or Wenger? 
we use Ringer solution because the Ringer, Ringer solution is uh, more closely to the normal CSF. Is it pre-warmed or uh, cold? Yes, it's pre-warmed. Pre-warmed. Second question, the uh, ETV CPC advocated by Professor Benjamin C. Woff, what is your experience in this regard? Have you ever tried? <laughs> uh, we have, I think at, we had around two patients with the CPC, where we did CPC, and these patients come from foreign country. One child came from Egypt. And I think, uh, I really don't remember the case so well, but I think we have only one child with a somehow good experience. But that was very, very interesting because the coral plexus, there was um, this, the lateral ventricles were full of coral plexus, very unusual on both sides and then we did the CPC and it seemed to work but on the other hand uh, we don't have enough experience to, to tell whether it works always or not. Thank you very much. One last question from me. You showed the neuro navigation with uh, uh, endoscopy. How, what is the utility of neuro navigation when you have already decompressed your ventricle and the entire preoperative anatomy that you have visualized on the MRI has changed. So when we use the navigation, yes, and what kind of uh, cases? In hydrocephalus, where yeah. once you are decompressed, the ventricle collapses and the entire anatomy might have changed. Now, I think, um, of course, if you, the navigation is, um, is interesting to find the right direction of the approach. This is important and when you're already inside, I think then it should work. And it is important in, in some cases of multi-loculated hydrocephalus. And of course, you have to take care how you position the patient. The head should be always, and I think only, almost everybody of you knows that the head must be in the upper position. So that when you open the, the, uh, the ventricle, the release of the CSF is very, uh, very slow. Or you put your finger on the bowl that everything is still somehow fine. And if you have a multi-loculated hydrocephalus and many or a few septas, uh, septums in, within the ventricle, then it's important, of course. Um, in general, the anatomical situation is not the same as before, you're right. But I think therefore it's still important in the early beginning to find the right approach, the right point for putting the borehole to have a good idea about the anatomical conditions inside. And then you know, finally you know that there are some fixed structures in the depths that uh, when you then use the navigation, you know how close you are to maybe to the floor of the third ventricle because this will not change so much and even yes. the aqueduct. Thank you, thank you very much. We can conclude our session by hearing the expert comments and concluding remarks from Professor Elias before we move on to the second session. Okay, thank you very much. I think we had a very good discussion. We discussed common, we discussed complications before and uh, many interesting questions. So I think I congratulate Professor Job Badov and uh, everyone who involved in this uh, first session. So thank you, uh, back to you Raja Kuti. Thank you very much. So we'll move on and I would invite Professor Jorge Mura to say a short introduction and who would in turn invite Professor Vieira for his lecture. Professor Mura, all yours. Yes, thank you very much to all of you to be here today. I'm uh, as, as vascular surgeons, I'm working now. I'm in the operating room. One of my young neurosurgeons is starting the surgery. And uh, here in Chile is uh, 10, 10 40 a.m. And uh, for me, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Vieira. He's from the north of Brazil, from Recife. Uh, uh, he, he, he's a um, I, I ask about him a lot because I am from Chile, a different country, but my reference from him is very good. Uh, the most important thing about him is a very good person. And uh, I think that the title of his con conference is very interesting about the microsurgery uh, in the endovascular era. I think that uh, for me that I started this in 1995, uh, uh, we, we see the development of endovascular techniques 
And I always say to my fellows in open cerebrovascular surgery, I have fellows as well in endovascular. I said that the, in the endovascular root of our treatment is all about the device. In the microsurgery the root of the treatment is all about the hands of the surgeon. And that's, that's uh, what uh, Eduardo is going to show us uh, today. Thank you very much, Professor Vieira. Thank you much, Tim. I appreciate it. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here and the invitation. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so, Professor George uh, said I'm going to talk today about open cerebral vascular neurosurgery in the endovascular era. Uh, can you see my, my pointer here? Yes. Oh, perfect. So this is my hospital, our hospital. Uh, it's uh, in Recife, in the northeast of Brazil. It's a large hospital. We perform approximately uh, 3,000 surgeries per year. Uh, and I, I happen to specialize in cerebrovascular neurosurgery. And from 2014, until this, this last month of October, uh, we treated more than for uh, 400 aneurysms and more than 80 AVMs and some cavernous malformation as well. Uh, well, it all started with the publication of, of ISAT in 2002. And since then we have witnessed a, a huge development in endovascular techniques and uh, endovascular devices. It started with conventional coiling and then balloon assisted coiling and then uh, stent assisted coil and more recently we have seen the the flow diverter stents and the the endovascular flow disruption endocircular flow disruption like the web device this is more recent uh, so this is for aneurysms and also for avms uh, we have seen technolo technological advances we have seen detachable catheters we have seen uh, liquid emboliz uh, embolizing agents like the onyx. And despite not being an endovascular technique, we, ha we also have to, to, to talk about radio surgery, uh, which means that many cases that were previous, previously treated with microsurgery, with the, the popularization of radio surgery, are no longer treated with microsurgery. So uh, it also was a technique that somehow stole some patients from surgery. Uh, so these technological advances in vascular device and radio surgery have caused a relative lack of interest among, especially among young neurosurgeons in the open treatment of cerebral vascular disease. This is especially true here in Brazil. Um, and such behavior pulls the pendulum even further toward the, the endovascular and radio surgical treatment. So we have sometimes easy uh, cerebral vascular lesions that, that are easy for, for microsurgery that are being treated um, with more complex device, uh, whether endovascular or radiosurgical treatment. And these, now, these, these new technologies have brought a great advance for the treatment of cerebrovascular disease, but uh, there are still lesions that we require open surgical treatment. And I'm gonna show you some cases of uh, some lesions, some cerebrovascular lesions that still today uh, are best treated or it can only be treated by microsurgery. So I'm gonna start with cavernous malformation. Uh, cavernous malformations, they are crypt uh, malformations, uh, meaning that they are angiographically occult vascular lesions and they can't be treated endovascularly. Uh, we also have propranolol in radiosurgery, but both treatments are, have, have questionable results and in fact, most cases we require microsurgical treatment um, uh, for specific situations. Uh, I'm going to show you just uh, this case of a, a giant cavernoma. This is a 23 year old male patient who's presented with uh, progressive left side and hemiparis due to this large insular cavernoma. And we can see here in tractography that the, the fibers of the capsule, the internal capsule, and uh, course in the medial uh, portion of the lesion. As you can see here the lesion. So this is the perfect approach for a trans, uh, perfect lesion for a trans approach. So this is the video. So 
So we're starting dissecting the, the Sibian fissure. Uh, it is important to, to dissect it very widely. You can see here now the, the insula. We can see hemosiderin here. So now we have completely dissected the Sibian fissure. We see both branches of the MCA. And here's the point where the, the carbonoma touch the cortica and the, the insula cortex. So here we, we do uh, perform this cordycectomy and reaching the lesion. So we now circumferentially dissecting the lesions. It's important to keep bipolar coagulation only in the carbonoma, especially in that medial part of the lesion. And you do it all around the carbonoma and it free uh, the adhesions and then you can remove the lesion. Through this transfusion approach, it's a very large lesion. And you can see no, no fixed brain retractors. And the lesion is completely removed now. And this is the final aspect. Uh, so this is a post-operative MRI in the patient. Uh, he had a, a transient worsening of the hemiparesis and did a complete recovery in 30 days. Moving on to, to brain uh, AVMs. Uh, here we have this systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which shows that surgical treatment is associated with high rates of obliterations and low rates of uh, post-treatment hemorrhage and a similar profile of complications when compared to endovascular and radio surgery treatment. Uh, for me, brain AVMs are primarily a surgical disease. Uh, because of time limit, I will not go into details about of our surgery indications criteria, but except for grade four and five uh, AVMs and some grade three um, AVMs located uh, in the brainstem or basal ganglia in neurologically intact patients. I believe that most patients uh, are, should be treated with, with surgery, with microsurgery. So I'm gonna start with this cerebellum encephalic uh, AVM, this 25 year old male patients presented with sudden onset headache and imbalance due to this uh, cerebellar hemorrhage. And we can see here that the lateral mesencephalic vein is enlarged, and here we can see the vent. Uh, also, we can see, and we can see uh, multiple full voids within the cerebellum mesencephalic fissure. Uh, the preoperative angiogram shows this uh, somewhat diffuse um, AVM supplied by branches of the superior cerebellar artery, and uh, the, the, the drainage is through this enlarged lateral mesencephalic vein up to the basal vein of. Rosenthal. So in this case, we perform a, a lateral supracerebellar infratentorial approach, which takes us directly into the ambient system. Here's the fourth nerve that is being dissected. And we're gonna move it superiorly and protect it. And here we can see uh, the superior and inferior branches of the superior cerebellar artery. We can see that inferior branch dives into the avium to supply the avium. And the superior branch runs alongside the natus, but does not emit feeding arteries. So here we are coagulating and cut the inferior branch that goes to the avium. And now we are uh, performing our cortisectomy. And in order to reach the deepest portion of the cerebellum encephalic fissure, we need to go underneath the AVM. And now we're moving laterally. Here's the brainstem. Here is the fifth nerve. And we can see that this is small portion of the nidus that is uh, adherent to the brainstem. So we are coagulating it so that it can shrink a little bit. And then it can, dissect it, can be dissected free from the brainstem. And now we're moving the nidus medially. 
In the deepest portion of the cerebellum as a cephalic fissure, here we can see the draining vein. It's already started to, to become blue. And here we can see that we are, the, the vein now blue. And we can coagulate it as close as possible to the avium in order to preserve the normal drainage of the brainstem, of the midbrain. So we're now dividing the drain vein and we can now remove the nidus. And here's the final aspect. So this is post-operative CT scan showing nice preservation of the brainstem and post-operative angiogram show a complete resection of the avian. Uh, the patient was discharged home on post-operative day six with no deaths. Uh, we published this video on the Neurosurgical Focus video last January. This is another case. Uh, uh, it's a 24 year old male patient who presented with sudden onset headache uh, due to this intraventricular hemorrhage. And here we can see the angiogram. Uh, here's the vertebral injection, which shows this, this AVM uh, supplied by branches from the posterior cerebral artery. But uh, we also see that the AVM is supplied by branches from the internal, left internal carotid artery, mainly from the, the middle cerebral artery and passage feeding branches, but not only uh, from the MCA, but also from the anterior choroidal artery. You can see in the video that uh, there are many branch in passage feeding arteries that uh, comes from the anterior choroidal artery. So here's the, the preoperative MRI, which shows this um, avium in the medial portion of the temporal lobe. And for me, it's the perfect case for a uh, transceiver, uh, optosagomatic and transceiver approach. As we can see here in the, in the video, we can see here a nice dissection and wide dissection of the cerebral fissure. And now we are uh, releasing and coagulating and cutting all feeding branches from the MCA and anterior temporal artery also. Now we're dissecting the, the avian from the third nerve and preserving and protecting the third nerve. Here's posterior cerebral artery. And now we're starting to go a little bit subtemporal just to, to find the branches from the PCA. And here we can see the anterior choroidal artery. It is enlarged and there are branches coming out from the anterior choroidal artery. Obviously, you have only to cauterize these, these feeding branches, preserving the, the anterior choroidal artery itself. Here's the branches from the PCA that are being coagulated and then divided. And now we have uh, almost completely devascularized the, the avium and we can now uh, circumdissect the nidus. And once you have uh, adequate uh, devascularization of the avium, you can start um, shrinking the, the nidus with coagulation. And here we can see the drain vein that will now be coagulated. and then divide. And now the nidus is removed and we can see this nice view, internal carotid artery. We can see here the perforators, lenticular striated arteries, all preserved. Here is the anterior choroidal artery preserved. It would, this was the branch that was going to the nidus. Here's fourth nerve. Uh, this is post-operative CT scan and uh, post-operative 
angiogram, uh, vertebral, and carotid injection show a complete obliteration of the knives. And the patient uh, did a very well recovery, no deaths. And even for eloquent area AVMs, uh, cortical uh, eloquent areas, uh, like this 38-year-old year female with sudden headache and mild hemiparesis due to this avian that is uh, in the in the pre central gyrus. Here we can see the preoperative angiogram, and here we perform the brain, the, the the mapping of the motor area that is here. And in these cases, you have to stay as close as possible to the nidus. Uh, in all cases, but uh, when you have a, a relatively compact avian in an eloquent area, you have to stay always very close to the nidus. And that's what we are doing now. Always very close to the nidus. Dissecting with a little piece of cottonoid. And we have this large venous aneurysm that it can be brought into the field, obviously after uh, devascularization of the nidus. And here we are coagulating the drainage vein and the nidus can be safely removed now. So this is the post-operative angiogram showing complete resection. The patient experienced a transient right leg paralysis, but she did a, a very good recovery with no deaths. Even for large avians uh, like this one, the patient presented with seizure, this is an unrupted avian. Uh, this is pre embo angiogram. Uh, this is post embo You can see there is still a large portion of, of the avian left after embolization and here we're starting to to look for the the supply that comes from the anterior cerebral artery this is left side uh, so we're starting coagulating this, this large feeding artery terminal feeding artery from the anterior cerebral artery and, and this is left side this is very close to to language site and once again we, we want to stay very close to the nidus and always come very close to the nidus always stay very close to the nidus and you avoid uh post-operative deaths by doing that the drain vein is now completely uh, uh empty and can be coagulated and removed. So the night is now removed. So this is post-operative CT scan and post-operative uh, angiogram showing complete resection. The patient also did a nice recovery. This is an interesting case. This is a 25 year old female. In 2017, she presented with sudden headache and drowsiness in this intraventricular uh, hemorrhage. She had no focal deaths. Uh, this is the, the 2017 angiogram, which shows this thalamic avian. Uh, the patient, she made a, a very good recovery. She was neurologically intact. So uh, she underwent radio surgery in March 2018. And in May 2019, uh, she presented to our emergency department with sudden onset left side hemiplegia and drowsiness due to this large uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. And uh, it is a, 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 a permanent death. The angiogram, 2019 angiogram, showed no, no great modification of the avian. Uh, so we, we perform microsurgical resection, uh, transcalosal contralateral approach. So the, the avian is in the left, in the right side, and we're approaching it from the left side. 
So here we're dissecting the atmospheric fissure. Uh, the nose is to our left. You can see here the corpus callosum. So we're now performing callosotomy. And here we can see foramen of Monroe. And here we can see this enlarged and arterialized drain vein, choroidal vein. Uh, we are dissecting from the, the septum pellucidum and moving laterally. This choroid plexus here and another drain vein here. So now we're starting to, to enter the thalamus. Now we are starting to dissect the pendima. And we'll try to, to move the, the nidus towards the ventricular cavity. So once again, we are very close to the nidus. You need to be aware that there will be perforating arteries and supplying this avian. These perforating arteries, they are not amenable to, to, to uh, regular coagulation. They need to be clipped in order that uh, for the coagulation to work. And here we are clip, clipping one and then coagulating. And we are now cutting. And here you can see that the avian is completely devascularized. We can see that the draining vein is now completely empty. And now we just go and remove the nidus. You can see that the contralateral trajectory is very straightforward and provides great uh, angle of attack. And this is post-operative CT scan and post-operative angiogram showing complete resection of the avian. This is a formal follow-up uh, uh, visit of the patient. This is another interesting case. This is a, a telemic avian patient, 17-year-old patient presented with sudden onset, sudden onset headache and left hemiparesis and also um, a monomous hemianopsia due to this pulvular thalamic uh, hemorrhage. Uh, this is a preoperative MRI showing that the, the avian is seated in the pulvular thalamic. Uh, it is supplied by branches uh, from the posterior cerebral artery. Uh, this is our posterior, lateral posterior choroidal vein and also from these perforated and thalamic perforated arteries. Uh, you can go from the ventricular cavity, dissect the choroidal fissure, and you will reach um, the, these more inferior branches and uh, lateral posterior choroidal arteries from this approach. So we perform the transucal approach through the, uh, through the intraparietal sulcus. Now we are entering the ventricle, coagulating a little bit of choroid plexus. And here we can see the fornix. And now we start dissecting between the fornix and the thalamus. And here we see posterior cerebral artery. This is parahippocampal gyrus. And we can see that there are several branches from the posterior cerebral artery. These branches are now being coagulated. And divided. And now we can see this is the fornix. This is parahippocampal gyrus, and here is the posterior cerebral artery, and here is the thalamus. So now our attention turns to that more anterior supply that comes from the, the thalamus perforating arteries, and we start the second and eventually find the, these arteries. As I said, they, they can't be coagulated. If you coagulate it without clipping, it will uh, uh, bleed, and we have very, very difficult time to, to coagulate it. So now we just 
moving more anteriorly. Coagulate a little bit more of choroid plexus and separate a little bit more of the, the, the fornix. And finish our dissection. This is the drain vein that is now completely blue. And we can now resect the nidus. We always leave an, an a central ventricular drainage cut at the end of surgery. So this is posterior uh, postoperative CT scan and postoperative angiogram show complete uh, resection of the nidus. The patient was discharged home on postoperative day 12 and she was neurologically intact. At, um, I mean, neurologically unchanged from a baseline status. Uh, and also, we're going to talk now about intracranial aneurysm. I don't know how much time I have. So, uh, microsurgical treatment of intracranial aneurysms in the endovascular death nowadays is mainly for wide neck aneurysms that are defined as the don't neck uh, relation um, uh, smaller than two or a uh, uh, neck uh, uh, bigger than four millimeters. Uh, this is the definition, and there is some variation, but it's the, it's the definition we use. And most, uh, not most, but it's not hair, it's not, it's not uh, unfrequent that these uh, white neck aneurysms also are large or giant, some are thrombotic, some are dissecting. And this is uh, the, the, the kind of aneurysm that we, we will need to, to deal with in this so-called endovascular area. Um, and this is especially true after subarachnoid hemorrhage when antiplatelet therapy are, are associated with high risk of, of hemorrhagic complications. So we start with this small white neck, vertebral artery aneurysm ruptured, and this is a 16, 61 year old female patient presented with sudden onset headache and drowsiness. She had an intraventricular hemorrhage on CT scan. So we always treat and these aneurysms for the far lateral approach. Uh, it provides a, a very good visualization. And here you can see the aneurysm. And you can see the, the lower cranial nerves here. And we are dissecting the aneurysm from the lower cranial nerves. We're now applying the first clip. These vertebral arteries can be very thick wall. And, uh, so uh, we use these fenestrated clips to reconstruct the neck. The, the fenestrated clip, uh, it has more uh, closing force in, at the tip of the aneurysm, at the tip of the of the clip. So, for the large and thick walled aneurysm, we usually use these fenestrated clips. So this is the second clip that deals with this uh, more distal part of the neck. There is a more proximal portion of the neck that is still open here, and we're going to use a third clip in order to deal with this more proximal part of the neck. So here is distal vertebral artery, lower cranial nerves, 9, 10, and 11, and proximal vertebral artery. We always use intraoperative microdopia to check for flow. And this is the final aspect. Uh, this is postoperative angiogram. And this is another case that uh, presented with hemorrhage and uh, this large uh, MCA aneurysm, very, very large neck. This is not amenable to endovascular uh, treatment. It needs to be treated surgically. So once again, uh, wide sylvan fissure splitting, it's, it's very important in this case. And try to recognize the anatomy. And here you can see M1. And here is the, the aneurysm. You can see front of M2, but we can't uh, see 
the temporary true, not yet. So uh, temporary clip goes on on the M1. It has to be placed as, as distal as possible in order to not put the lenticular striate arteries under ischemia. So now we're starting to get a look on the, on the temporal M2, it is here. So we start to plan which clip you will use. You can see the, the temporal M2 here behind the aneurysm. It goes around the, the dome of the, of the aneurysm. Now goes the first clip. And then we release the temporary clip. So for, for these large honors, we never use only one clip, at least two clips. But uh, as you see here, uh, we check flow. It was good on M2, in front of M2, but we had no flow on front of, on temporal M2. So we applied another clip and removed the, the more proximal one. So now we have a good flow on the temporal M2. And just I'm gonna apply one more clip. This other was very, the walls were very thick. And now we start to move the domus. And there is uh, a small neck remnant here in the in the frontal M2 related to the frontal M2 that we apply these two more clips in order to completely occlude the aneurysm. Now the flow is good. You can see a, a nice overview of the reconstruction. So this is post-operative. An uh, angiogram should complete reconstruction of the, the under's neck and nice preservation of both M2. This is an odd case of a large paraclina with aneurysm. This is a 58 year old male patient with sudden onset headache and confusion. This large aneurysm, uh, left side and aneurysm paraclinoid. So uh, here we can see we are in the left side. This is the large aneurysm. This is bifurcation of the internal carotid artery and the, the internal carotid artery distal to the aneurysm. Of course, in this case, we always have to perform the, the clinoidectomy. Uh, it is important for the, the vascular neurosurgeon nowadays that uh, to be familiar with how to perform the, the anterior clinoidectomy. We perform it a lot. And so we start um, drilling the clinoid, anterior clinoid process. We are now in roofing the optic nerve, the, the optic canal, and re release all the adhesions of the, the anterior clinoid artery and then remove it. But this is not enough. We always need to also drill the, the optic strut. It's very important, these large anders and also in those uh, medial ones, uh, like superior hypophysial aneurysms. So now we are opening the phosphorum ligament. Finish the, the opening of the phosphorum ligament. Here we can see the optic nerve. You see it is displaced medially. And this is the distal dura ring. Uh, you need to dissect it circumferentially in order to mobilize the internal carotid artery and then uh, apply the, the clips more safely and without tension to the optic nerve. Uh, so now we are finished our dissection. 
when opening the 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 distal dura ring, it is important to stay always uh, under the ophthalmic artery. So you can see here the optic nerve. As I said, it is displaced medially. This is all the aneurysm. Here is the distal neck. And here goes the, the first clip. It is a fenestrated clip. As I said, the, the closing force, the closing pressure, the tips of the aneurysm is higher. It is in pressure, yeah, especially important in these large or giant aneurysms. So one clip and now the second one. You can see that the proximal neck is within the, the fenestration. Uh, this means that we need an additional clip to close this proximal neck. And now the aneurysm is occluded and we can now open and, and decompress the brain. So this is the final aspect. We always check for, for flow with the micro -dropper. And the final aspect. This is the postoperative angiogram showing complete occlusion of the animal. Uh, there are, however, uh, these some uh, giant animals that do not be clippable. Uh, they are not amenable for clipping. Like in this case, the the animals was uh, the, the animals wall was was too thick and calcified. Uh, it was not possible to clip the other. In this case, we will need to perform a high flow bypass. So we always use uh, the radio artery, like in this case. Uh, this is, unfortunately, I don't have the video for the surgery. Uh, this is post-operative CT angiogram and post-operative uh, uh, DSA showing occlusion of the aneurysm and, and patency of the radio artery bypass. Uh, Thrombotic aneurysms, we frequently, we need to deal with this kind of aneurysm. This was a 62-year-old female patient presented with cranial uh, nerve 3, the third cranial nerve palsy, and right side hemiparesis. She was previously submitted to, to microsurgery in another department. And we can see this large mass uh, okay. full of thrombi and compressing the brainstem. Uh, here is the, the preoperative angiogram. Of course, it, it is feeling only, uh, uh, I think, half of the aneurysm. The other part is strong, but uh, so we start uh, dissecting the aneurysm. Uh, I'm sorry, dissect the, the sylvan fissure and prepare it for a possible bypass. And here is uh, clinodectomy. Uh, we are now dissecting the aneurysm. Here's the, the clip, it was of the aneurysm. And we'll now perform a, a trapping of the aneurysm. The first clip goes on the, the clinoidal segment of the carotid artery. And the second goes distal to the, to the aneurysm but it's still in the carotid artery. So now, in order to, to apply any, any kind of clip to, into this aneurysm, we need to, to remove, to open the aneurysm and remove some thrombi. And that is what we are doing now with the ultrasonic aspirator. And now the aneurysm is, is much softer and we can apply in a permanent clip to exclude the aneurysm from the circulation. And now we can remove the, the temporary clips and restore flow in the internal carotid artery. This is anterior choroidal artery. And now we can go on and further decompress the brain, remove some more trauma.
And this is the, the final aspect of the coronary artery. Uh, this is post-operative angiogram and post-operative CT scan. This is the one, the, the lower one, showing that the animal is now empty and the brain is decompressed. Uh, this is a, a, a patient who presented with hydrocephalus with drowsiness due to hydrocephalus. And this can be easily mistaken as a colloid cyst, third ventricle colloid cyst. But on MRI, we, we have seen that is giant a big flow void. you can see that both H2 are are living here from this flow void. so this is this was an aneurysm a large acom aneurysm here uh, i'm going to skip the video because of time and uh, it's it's another kind of of lesion that we have to deal uh with uh in this endovascular era and uh, um relieve and release the, the relief the mass effect from this aneurysm. Uh, just two more cases to finish. This is a dissecting, dissecting pica aneurysm. Uh, this is a 72 year old male patient presented with sudden onset headache and a small subarachnoid hemorrhage here in the prepontine and premedullary system. You can see here that there's a small amount of blood here. So this patient underwent uh, angiography and revealed this dissecting pica aneurysm. Uh, in this case, uh, pica aneurysms, they are very frequent dissecting aneurysms. So we, we need to be aware of this and we always need to be aware to perform, uh, be ready to perform some kind of revascularization procedure for this kind of aneurysm. So here, once again, this is the, uh, a, a phylateral approach. You can see the pica here, both pikas. So here we can see the aneurysm. So this is the inflow, this is the pica, this is the inflow, this is the outflow, and this is the aneurysm. Uh, it, it is an aneurysm that it can't be clipped, so we need to perform some kind of revascularization procedure here. So uh, the pica was very redundant and we chose to perform a, a uh, in situ bypass, a reanastomosis. So we are cutting the inflow. Now cutting the outflow. And then we, we will reanastomose the pica. It's an end to end anastomosis. We always perform with interrupted sutures. Now we can we can see the, the the lumen of the artery, and it is important to check if there was any suture that caught the the opposite wall. In this case, there there wasn't, and we will now complete the the anastomosis. So now we're moving the, the distal clip. And now the, the proximal clip. And checking for patency. Maybe we observe the group flow. And this is the final aspect. Post-operative angiogram show uh, the exclusion of the aneurysm and preservation of the flow in the in the pica. Just for comparison, this is pre-operative and post-operative angiogram. 
And the last case, this is a, a 15, 50 year old female patient presented with sudden onset headache and drowsiness due to this large Sylvan Fisher hemorrhage. And uh, this angiogram, uh, it is not a normal MCA animal. So it's probably the dissecting one. You can see that there's stenosis, there's enlargement, there's uh, it is affecting multiple branches, not only the frontal, but also the temporal, okay, more than one part of the artery. So this is very likely to be a, a dissecting, a dissecting aneurysm. So uh, we need to be prepared to, to treat this aneurysm. And we dissect both branches of the STA, the frontal, and uh, also the temporal branch. And you can see STA, frontal branch, temporal branch. Uh, so we're starting to dissect the sibian fissure. And here we can see that it, it is a complete mess here. We, we don't have, it's, it's not possible to clip uh, others like this one, so we perform uh, bypass. We had to use both branches. Uh, so the the longer one, which was the the temporal, I'm sorry, the the parietal branch of the STA, goes to the frontal MCA. So here we are from the first two stitches, toe and heel, in order to secure the, the donor vessel in place. And we are starting to perform our suture. Now we, we are released the distal clips in the recipient artery, and now uh, releasing the clip in the donor artery. And now we perform the first bypass from parietal branch of STA to the frontal M2. And now we will have to, to prepare for the second bypass into this um, cortical M4 branch of the temporal M2. So we are reusing here the, the frontal branch of the STA into the, the temporal branch of the MCA. So we finished one side, now we're starting to do the second side. And we are now finished the the bypass. Now we are releasing the recipient vessel from the temporary clips. And now we're storing flow in the frontal branch of the STA. And now we have uh, one bypass to the frontal M2, one bypass to temporal M2. And now we can trap the asthma. You can see here that, that only uh, performing the frontal lobe retraction, uh, the aneurysm rupture, the dissect aneurysm rupture. And we are placing now one permanent clip in the most distal portion of M1, but we still had to deal with some bleeding and then we now are completely trapping the aneurysm with one clip in the M2, in the temporal M2. And now the, the aneurysm is trapped and you can see here that uh, it, it destroyed completely the, the bifurcation of the MCA. So here's the final aspect. So parietal branch to frontal M2, frontal branch to temporal M2. Uh, 
This is post-operative angiogram shown complete occlusion here of the aneurysm and the, the bypass, so-called double barrel bypass to frontal and temporal injury. So in conclusion, uh, despite endovascular and radiosurgical technological advance, uh, microsurgical perspective is still necessary for the adequate treatment of central nervous system vascular lesions. Uh, microsurgery is needed for the treatment of cavernous malformation, arterial venous malformations, aneurysms, and also for cerebral vascular ischemic disease, especially uh, chronic cerebral vascular ischemic disease. And I believe that young neurosurgeons should be encouraged to subspecialize in this area of, of neurosurgery in open cerebral vascular neurosurgery. So this is my city, Recife, and our hospital. I'd like once again to thank you for the invitation to be talking to you today. Thank you very much for your conference. This was very good, very complete. You talk about all about the current aspects of the good cerebrovascular surgery. And, and, and you told us well about the, the revascularization ischemic disease. It's very important because the ischemic disease, in my opinion, will be the future of cerebrovascular surgery, especially with the treatment of the stroke now, that the microsurgery is still is not used. It's, uh, now it's only endovascular and, and, and neurologist uh, field. But I think the microsurgery can, can do a lot and offer a lot for the patients, especially for uh, improve of the collaterals that we can do with, uh, with the STA, MCA bypass mainly. And as you said, it's very important to encourage the, the young neurosurgeons to keep uh, training in cerebrovascular surgery. As told you before, the endovascular treatment is all about the device because it's the, the learning curve is very short, one or two years. The difference with microsurgery is uh, all about the hands. The learning curve is very long. You take five to 10 years to be a good uh, cerebrovascular microsurgeon. And then it's very important to, to say to the young people that need to be patient to have results like Professor Vieira. It's not from, you, know, you cannot reach this kind of results from one day to the next. You need to take time, you need to be patient and you need to train. But uh, as he showed, the microsurgery still today, 2021, is a, is a very good option and it's necessary for a lot of cerebrovascular disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mura. we we'll take some questions, few, because we are like lack of time. Yes, my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Singh. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Raja. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very comprehensive talk. Uh, I just have one question, Professor. Uh, what do you think about the application of awake craniotomy for cranial vascular surgery? Do you think it's a fantasy or necessity? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I believe that for cavernous malformation, we can use it. And also for some AVMs. Uh, actually, we, we stopped doing uh, for AVMs because uh, I believe that the uh, relative ischemic uh, tissue around the avium uh, makes that cortical uh, eloquent areas to move. So we performed, uh, I, I think, four cases for, for avms uh, near uh, language sites and uh, awake, awake surgery. And uh, it happened that in, in every case, it was very far from the avium. So uh, nowadays, we don't use awake craniotomies for AVMs, for AVMs. And uh, I believe that if you stay close enough to the nidus, very close to the nidus, obviously, you, you need to, to observe some aspects of the angular architecture of the AVM, but always stay as close as possible to the nidus, and yeah, you don't have a trouble with it. You may have uh, transient and dysphagia, it is uh, somewhat expected, especially because of the flow uh, change that happens after you reject an AVM. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. May I kindly ask Professor Vieira one question that what is your anticoagulation policy in emergency bypasses when you have a ruptured aneurysm and when you do a STMC? What is your anticoagulation policy? Do you use heparin? 
or just intraoperative heparin irrigation or systemic heparinization? Yes, uh, uh, we don't use heparin, uh, systemic heparin, always just uh, irrigation with heparin isoline. And uh, regarding antiplatelet medications, if it is a ruptured aneurysm, we don't use it preoperatively, uh, but we start as soon as the patient waits. And so we start uh, 300 milligrams of aspirin. And if it is an unrupt, uh, aneurysm, or if it is a, a ischemic disease, uh, ischemic disease, the patient usually is already in use, but for unruptured aneurysm, when you are uh, considering a bypass three days uh, previous to surgery, we start antiplatelet agents. Thank you. Thank you very much. As our first speaker, Professor George Baldoff is still here. There is a question that has been popped up in the chat box where my good friend Tinu Ravi Abraham asked, how to make sure that you do not stretch the foramen Monroe too much when you're accessing posterior third ventricle for a biopsy? Yes. Um, uh, it really depends on the diameter of the foramen in, um, in relation to the endoscope. And I think um, there was the former colleague who uh, sp has spoken about the same problem. Um, you need the right directory, especially when you only want to do an ETV. And um, we have this uh, special device, a blunt trocar, to push um, to push the foramen, dilate the foramen a little bit. Then it's um, it's possible if you don't have a very small endoscope, uh, it might be might be a problem. You really have to check both sides left and right side of the MRI where the foramen of Monroe is a little bit bigger and then decide uh, which side you to, to choose for the ETV. Thank you, thank you very much. We had both great lectures. Now we can wind up this session. Now I would like to invite Professor Jorge Murat to say his concluding remarks. Yes, I want to thank to everybody who participate. The first lecture about ATV was very good as well. Uh, we, we, we always learn about different disciplines in these uh, webinars. And the second lecture of Professor Vieira was very, very good, very complete, as said before. And I, I only said that the, the micro series is, is completely alive and it's good for, for the young uh, people to see that the micro series is very entertaining, it's very nice to do, even if uh, you, you spend a lot of time studying and dissecting a laboratory and everything, it's a good time to spend. And, uh, and they, they will very, very, the patients will be very grateful because the patient need microsurgery and all, all the other disciplines to treat the, the different pathologies. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was thank indeed you. very interesting. Now we'll wind this session up and uh, I'll close this officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yuko Katro, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers of today, Professor George Baldoff and Professor Eduardo Vera, and the chairs, Professor Azmi Elias and Professor Jorge Mura, for their time and support for the educational initiatives of the ACNS. A special thanks to our main mentor from China, Professor Shubin, who has been supporting, ever supporting in our educational ventures and he has broadcasted this webinar on the WeChat and this is live on Zoom and YouTube as well. Today we have more than 1,530 people who are viewing this uh, webinar live. So we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for that. A special thanks to my co-host Dr. Liu Boon Singh also for joining today. So until we all meet on the 30th of October, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.